Good evening. It's good to be together tonight. Appreciate this time that we've been able to spend in worship together. Appreciate those who have led us in our worship tonight. We've had a great day here at Highland Heights and the time that we've been able to spend praising our God, the time that we've been able to spend studying His Word. We had an excellent meal a little bit earlier today, so appreciate everybody who participated in that and the opportunity to come back together tonight. It's truly a blessing. Perhaps many of you recognize this is my first Sunday night since we've been here over the last five or six weeks. We've had a rotation of guys throughout the congregation who have been preaching to us and presenting lessons from the pulpit. I'd like to begin by saying I appreciated that so much. Not just because I didn't have to preach, but because I was enriched by the lessons that I was able to hear. I'm thankful to be a part of a congregation who has so many people who are so talented in so many different ways. But it's not just about being talented, but having a willingness to use that talent for the glory of God. I told a couple of different people before I got up tonight that it'd be okay with me if we just went back through that rotation of guys. And maybe that's something you'll be saying after a few Sunday nights. Yes, please bring back those guys. Uh, but looking forward to the time we're going to be able to spend studying together. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. If you have your copy of God's Word and would like to turn there. Ephesians chapter 1. And in just a few minutes, we're going to step into those first couple verses. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Let's say for just a moment, let's pretend for just a moment that you are going to build a house on this piece of land. Everything's ready to go. The piece of land is ready to go. The people who you're building the house for, they're ready to go. And you're ready to go as the builder. You have all of your machinery. You have all of your tools. You have your crew with all the different jobs that they have. Where are you going to start in building that house? Are you going to start by building the walls? Are you going to start by building the ceiling? Are you going to start by putting in all of the kitchen sinks? Are you going to start by laying some carpet or laying hardwood floors? Well, I hope not. If that's where you're going to start in building a house, then I certainly don't want you building my house. If you're going to build a house, then you have to start by doing what? Building the foundation. Once you build the foundation underneath, then you're able to build up. If you don't build the foundation, then you're not going to be able to properly build the house. Let's think about something maybe a little bit easier than building a house, and that's building a relationship with somebody else. Let's say that you want to build a friendship with another person. Where are you going to start in building that friendship? Are you going to start by walking up to them in the first conversation and asking, hey, what's your deepest and darkest secret? Would you please share that with me? Are you going to walk up to them and say, hey, how would you like to go on a seven or eight day vacation? Nice to meet you. Of course, you're not going to start there. If you're looking to build a relationship with somebody, how about you start by saying hello? How about you start by getting to know that person? Maybe invite them out to lunch. Invite them to go get a cup of coffee and learn some facts about them. Tonight, we're beginning a study of the letter that we call Ephesians. Over the next several months, section by section, we're going to be walking throughout the book of Ephesians together. Before we dive into the text though, before we get too deep into this study, I think it's important for us to spend some time introducing the book of Ephesians. Just like building a house, before we build up in this letter, we need to start by establishing the foundation. As we build a relationship with this letter that we call Ephesians, it's important for us to start by saying hello to know some facts about the book of Ephesians before we wade too deep into it. So as we think about our study tonight, as we spend some time in the Word of God tonight, I would like for us to ask five major questions about the book of Ephesians. And in doing that, I hope that we'll build a solid foundation that in the upcoming months we can build on top of. Let's start with this first question. Who wrote the book of Ephesians? Who's responsible for the words that we find here? Who's the human author of this letter? You don't have to read very far in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1 to find the answer, do you? What's the very first word there in the first verse of Ephesians chapter 1? Paul. You know Paul's story? It's a pretty powerful story, isn't it? It's a story that teaches us about how Jesus can change a person's life. How Jesus can completely transform someone 
from the inside out. When you think about Paul, before he was identified as Paul in the narrative of the book of Acts, he was identified as Saul. Saul was a persecutor of the church. The first time that he's mentioned is in Acts chapter 7 and verse number 58 where Stephen, the first Christian martyr, is about to be stoned. And the Bible says that the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. It seems that he's kind of passive when you look at Acts 7 and verse 58, but it doesn't take long for him to become active in persecuting the church. Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, Saul was ravaging the church like a bull in a china shop. I had a teacher explain it that way one time. He was entering house after house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, the Bible says that Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. But then you read just a few verses later in Acts chapter 9 verses 3 through 6, as he's on the road to the city of Damascus in order to further persecute the church and to put Christians into prison, he has one moment with Jesus on that road. And it changes everything for him. To make a long story short, he goes into the city of Damascus. He meets a man named Ananias who baptizes him in Acts chapter 9 and verse 18. Paul tells us in Acts 22 and verse number 16 what Ananias told him. You remember what it was? Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You fast forward down to verse number 20. Immediately, as soon as he was baptized, he went out and proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying He is the Son of God. Immediately after his conversion, he began preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's what he did the rest of his life. That's what he's doing when we study together in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is one of the 13 letters that we have in our New Testament written by this individual, Paul. Like we said, Paul's story is powerful. It teaches us about what Jesus Christ can do in a person's life. He can take one of the greatest enemies of the church at the time and turn him into, transform him into one of the greatest missionaries to ever live. And so we're talking about Paul. What do we need to know about Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1? Paul tells us that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus, just like the 12 that we read about and then the one who's added in Acts chapter 1. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's a statement that solidifies his authority. The word apostle literally means one who is sent on a specific task, one who is sent for a specific purpose. That was the apostle Paul. He was sent by Jesus to proclaim the good news of Jesus, to preach the gospel of Jesus to souls who were lost. He was an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. That's talking about the source of his apostleship. He was an apostle of Christ Jesus, not by his own will, not by somebody else's will, but by the very will of God. Who wrote the book of Ephesians? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Question number two, where was Ephesians written? Where did the apostle Paul write this letter from? That's an important question for us to consider because location matters. If I were to write you a letter from a vacation at the beach, that letter would sound very different than one that I might write from a hospital room. Location matters. Where's Paul whenever he writes this letter that we call Ephesians? When you read throughout the book, you find some hints at where Paul is located. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 1, Paul says that he was a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1 says that he was a prisoner for the Lord. And then in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 20, he calls himself an ambassador in chains. How does Paul identify himself throughout the book of Ephesians? A prisoner, an ambassador in chains. What does that tell us about where Paul was located? It seems that Paul wrote this letter from an imprisonment, from his house arrest, while he was in the city of Rome, a house arrest that lasted about two years. It's the same imprisonment, it's the same house arrest that we read about in Acts chapter 28 and verse number 16, all the way to the end of the book of Acts there in chapter 28. 
where Luke writes, we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. It seems that Paul writes Ephesians like Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians from house arrest in the city of Rome where he remained for about two years. Which leads us into our third question, when was Ephesians written? If Paul wrote this letter in his first imprisonment in the city of Rome, if he wrote that letter in that house arrest that we can read about at the end of the book of Acts, it seems that the book of Ephesians would have been written somewhere between A.D. 60 to 62. That's significant for us to know. As we're getting to know this book, building a foundation, building a relationship with this letter that we call Ephesians, this helps us to know where it fits in the chronology of Paul's life and in the chronology of Christian history somewhere between A.D. 60 to 62. Question number four. We're going to spend a little bit more time with this one. To whom was Ephesians written? It's written by Paul from his house arrest in the city of Rome somewhere between 60 to 62 A.D. But who are the recipients? Who are the original recipients of this letter? Well, you keep reading there in the first verse of the book, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1, Paul says that he's writing to the saints. That word saints literally means the holy ones or the holy people. When Paul talks about the saints, or any other New Testament author talks about the saints, he's talking about the holy people of God, the people who God has made holy through Jesus, the people who are attempting to live holy lives. I know that there are some religious groups that make a distinction between the word saint and the word Christian, where all saints are Christians, but not necessarily all Christians are saints. The New Testament does not contain that distinction. All Christians are saints. All Christians are the holy people of God, those who have been made holy through Jesus Christ. Paul says that's who I'm writing to. I'm writing to the saints who are in Ephesus. Maybe when you're reading in your translation that you have open in front of you, you might have a footnote there beside those two words in Ephesus that says something like the earliest manuscripts, the earliest copies of Ephesians do not contain these two words. And that's the case. The three most reliable, most trustworthy, oldest manuscripts, the oldest copies that we have of the book of Ephesians do not contain the words in Ephesus. That's why many people suggest that Ephesians could have been a circular letter, not only written to the church at Ephesus, but also other churches in that area. I believe, though, based on the external tradition, based on the external history, that this was certainly a letter that was received by those in Ephesus from the Apostle Paul. We need to note that Paul had a very close relationship with the Christians in the city of Ephesus. We read about that in the book of Acts on three different occasions. First, in Acts chapter 18, verses 18 through 21, to our knowledge, that was Paul's first time in the city of Ephesus. At the end of his second missionary journey, he visited Ephesus for a very short, for a very brief time. The longer visit, a visit that lasted three years, comes in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 41. Can you imagine the close relationships that Paul would have built in three years in Ephesus? If you're familiar with his three missionary journeys, then you know that Paul was constantly moving around. He was constantly going to different places. It's significant to note that he remained in the city of Ephesus for a total of three years, three consistent years. We see the close relationships that he built with at least the elders in the city of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 38, where Paul meets the Ephesian elders in the city of Miletus on his way to Jerusalem and ultimately on his way to the city of Rome to say goodbye to them, to say farewell to them. Do you remember that scene? where after Paul speaks to them and gives them multiple warnings and tells them, this is the last time you're going to see my face. This is the last time we're going to be together. They hug each other. They're crying. They're weeping at the thought of the last time they're going to be able to share fellowship together and spend time with one another. And so maybe later this week, if you have some time, spend some time in the book of Acts 
these three different instances where Paul spends time with the Christians at Ephesus or spends time in the city of Ephesus, and you'll be able to see the very close relationship that he built with the Christians there. What about the ancient city of Ephesus? What do we know about Ephesus in the time that Paul would have written this letter? One thing we need to note about this city is that it, was a ve- it had a very strong economy. It was a port city. It was a center for not only trade through sea, but also trade on land. There was a lot going on in the city of Ephesus, which led to it having a very large population. Some scholars estimate that at the time Paul wrote this letter, there would have been 250,000 people living in the city of Ephesus. Now, when we look at that from modern times, that's not a very large city. We can think about cities that are a whole lot larger than that. But in ancient times, that was a huge population. 250,000 people in one city. You think about those people, they were very diverse. While the city of Ephesus did have a population of Jews, it also had a large population of of Gentiles. It was a city that was ethnically diverse. And you see that in the text of Ephesians, especially when you study through about the last half of Ephesians chapter 2 and into Ephesians chapter 3, you're going to see Paul talk about how they should deal with the different relationships that existed in the church ethnically, how there were both Jew and Gentile who were brought into one man, how Jesus is the cornerstone bringing those two very different people groups together. It was also a religiously diverse city. Most of the Gentiles in the city of Ephesus would have been polytheistic, worshiping and serving more than one God, opposed to being monotheistic like the Jews and the Christians, worshiping and serving only one God. One commentator mentioned that in the city of Ephesus at this time, there would have been about 50 different gods, and of course using that term with a little g, there would have been 50 different gods that would have been worshipped at the time that Paul wrote this letter. In the city of Ephesus, religiously, there was a site that's considered today one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. It was the temple of the Greek god Artemis or the Roman goddess Diana, an equivalent God, but going by different names. You can read about this in Acts chapter 19, by the way. The temple of Artemis or Diana existed in the city of Ephesus. People from all over the world would travel to Ephesus to worship that Greek or Roman God there. There's the remains of the temple, and so it's no longer present in modern day Ephesus. There's a replica of it, though, in Istanbul. Just to give you a little bit of an idea about how big this temple would have been, have you visited the Parthenon in Nashville? This temple is about four times the size of the Parthenon, which the replica is in Nashville, the original one being in Athens. And so that would have been the center of religion in Ephesus is this temple. So who's Paul writing to? He's writing to the saints the holy people of God who are located in the city of Ephesus. But watch this last descriptor. He says that he's writing to those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. That's a beautiful statement, isn't it? That here are people who are placing their faith in Jesus, but it's not just a mental ascent, but they're living faithfully to Jesus every single day. Which is kind of interesting. Because if you fast forward about 30 years to the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 4, Jesus addresses the church at Ephesus and says that they were guilty of leaving or abandoning the love that they had at first. Leaving their first love. That's where they were about 30 years down the line. But when Paul wrote this letter, they were faithful in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that say something to us about consistency? Just because you're a Christian today doesn't mean that you'll be a Christian 10 years from now. Just because you're faithfully following Jesus and faithfully loving Jesus today doesn't mean that will be the case 15, 20 years from now. When we follow Jesus, it's not just about today, but the next day and every other day that follows. Jesus later on tells the church at Ephesus words that we oftentimes quote from Revelation 2 and verse 10. Be faithful unto what? Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. We have that same mission today. I love the way that Paul describes his readers in Ephesians 6 and verse 24, that they are those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. 
What did the church at Ephesus look like? They were in love with Jesus. They were so in love with Jesus that they had a love for Him that was eternal, a love that was incorruptible, a love that would not fade away. Who was Ephesians written to? We're talking to the holy people of God, the saints who are in Ephesus, those who are faithful in Christ Jesus, those who love our Lord Jesus with a love incorruptible. And then finally, question number five, why was Ephesians written? What's the purpose of this letter? What are some of the main themes and concepts that we need to look out for as we walk through this letter together? Well, let's start more general. Let's start a little bit more broad in answering that question by saying something about the structure of Ephesians. If you want to outline the book of Ephesians, you can do that very simply. You can do that very easily. The first three chapters are doctrinal in nature. In chapters 1-3, through three, Paul is communicating concepts, he's communicating ideas, he's teaching. The purpose is to give doctrine. But you look at the last three chapters, the last three chapters are not that way. The turning point is in chapter 4 and verse number 1 where Paul becomes very practical. It's as if in the first three chapters, Paul's saying, here's what you need to know, and then the last three chapters, here's what you need to do with that knowledge. Here's the knowledge that you need to have in your mind. Here's what you need to know about Jesus and about the church that belongs to Jesus. Chapters 1-3. through three, And then here's how you apply that knowledge to your life in chapters 4-6. through six. Here's the difference that that knowledge makes in the way that you choose to live on a daily basis. And so the structure of Ephesians is very balanced. Half of it is very doctrinal and half of it is very practical. But what about some of the specific themes? throughout the book of Ephesians that we need to watch out for. The main theme of the book of Ephesians is the church of Christ. Now understand, I'm not using that term in a denominational way. I'm not using that phrase as a title like Walmart or Chick-fil-A or McDonald's. When we talk about the church of Christ here, we're talking about the church that belongs to Jesus Christ. We're talking about the church that was established by Jesus. Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 18, we're talking about the church that has been purchased with His own blood in Acts chapter 20 and verse number 28. That is the theme that Paul continually comes back to when you read throughout these six chapters. He talks about the church that belongs to Christ as Jesus' body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all in chapter 1 and verse 23. He talks about the church as God's household in chapter 2 and verse number 19. The family of God made up of both Jew and Gentile. He talks about the church that belongs to Jesus as the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. He talks about the church that belongs to Christ as those who make known the wisdom of God to the world in chapter 3 and verse number 10. He talks about the church of Christ as the bride of Christ in Ephesians 5, verses 22 and 23, where he instructs husbands to love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. If you want to read a book that's all about the church, if you want to read a letter that's all about how the church was established and how the church should function, how the church should look in today's time, you need to spend time in the book of Ephesians. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing over the next several months. Another thing that we need to watch out for in the book of Ephesians is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. What does your relationship with Jesus look like right now? Is it strong? Is it weak? Does it need some work? Do you feel distance in your relationship with Jesus? Ephesians is a book that will help you to appreciate Jesus so much that you have no other choice but to draw closer to Him and to draw deeper in relationship with Him. As we read throughout and study throughout Ephesians, we're going to see Paul use the phrase in Christ or something like it 27 different times. That's just in six chapters. 27 times in just six chapters. Paul wants us to know, he wants to explain to us what it means to be in Christ and to live our lives in Christ. Here's a quote from a commentary by Jay Lockhart about this phrase, in Christ, and how Ephesians focuses on our relationship with Him. I think it's helpful. He, see, he writes, it's in Christ that the faithful live and are blessed with all spiritual blessings. 
These blessings include being chosen, accepted, redeemed, forgiven, and united with God. Being in Christ makes us heirs of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Those in Christ are near to God, are sitting together with Christ in the heavenlies or the heavenly places, the way that the majority of translations do that, are God's new creation, are reconciled to other Christians, are God's building, are bold before God, and are empowered by God. Additionally, Christ is presented as the head of the church and the Savior of the body. He's the cornerstone of God's building, the church, and the centerpiece of God's purpose. He's the crucified, resurrected, and glorified Lord who equips the church to do His work. Whose work is it? It's His work, and He equips us to do it. He's the husband of His bride, the church, and is the one through whom we glorify God. Christ is the proper object of our love. That's what we learn from the book of Ephesians, that Christ is the proper object of our love, that we should love Jesus and we should be willing to do anything that we can to grow in our relationships with Him, to live and to be simply in Christ. And then the third idea that we need to mention, I realize that this is not an exhaustive list. There are other things that we could say here. But another one of the main themes that you find throughout the book of Ephesians is a focus on the spiritual realm or a focus on the spiritual dimension. So often, I don't know if you have this struggle, but I do. So often as we live our lives, we become so focused on what's around us. We become so focused on what we can sense. We become so focused on things that are physical in nature that we're not looking beyond them to think about what's going on in the spiritual realm, to think about what's happening in the spiritual dimension that we can't see with our physical eyes. Paul helps us to put our eyes on it. Paul helps us to think about it. Paul reminds ourselves of it. He uses that term heavenly places or, or literally the heavenlies six different times. That's one time per chapter, Paul wants us to think about the good things that are going on in the spiritual dimension. How we're able to claim all of the blessings, not some, not most, but all of the blessings that exist in the spiritual realm. But he also wants us to think about the negative, evil things that are going on in the spiritual realm. Like in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, and how we are able to be victorious over them, not based on our own strength, but based on the strength that God provides for us. This is a book that sets our eyes on things above instead of on things below. And I think that's a reminder that we need from time to time. I know that's a lot of information that we've covered in just a short amount of time, and there's a whole lot more that we could say here, but I hope that walking through those five questions is helpful and beneficial in building a foundation for us as we leap into this study of the book of Ephesians. Before we close, though, let's take some time to think about ourselves. Do you want the things that we've talked about tonight in your life? Do you want to be one of the holy people of God? Do you want to live your life in Christ, living in relationship with Him? Do you want to be one of those who are faithful to Christ Jesus, who love Him with an incorruptible love? Do you want to be a part of the church of Christ, the church that belongs to Jesus Christ, that He has purchased and obtained with His own blood, over which He reigns as head? Do you want to set your eyes on a daily basis on things above instead of on things below? If that's something that you want, then recognize we need to spend some time in Ephesians. And we're going to do that together. We're going to do that collectively. But I also want to encourage you and I want to challenge you tonight that throughout the week, spend some time in the book of Ephesians. Throughout the week, spend just a few moments thinking about different sections throughout the book of of Ephesians. I think if we can think about this letter and think about this book, not only on a collective level, but on an individual level, then we will be the individuals and we will be the congregation that Jesus Christ wants us to be. Are you tonight where Jesus wants you to be, living your life in Christ? If we can help you with that, we'd love to. As together we stand and sing.